So the afterlife becomes a very interesting discussion in Hebrew roots when we understand what the afterlife is. So there are two destinations that are taught in Christianity. There is heaven and hell. And in Hebrew roots, we also believe that there are two destinations, heaven and hell. When we're talking about heaven and hell, in the Hebrew, we're looking at some particular words that we want to know their meanings of. One would be heaven or heavens is Shamaya or Shamayim in Hebrew. So when we ever see the Iim on a word, we know that it's plural. So Shamaya is heaven, Shamayim is heavens. And then we have the grave or the pit is referred to as Shaul. Now Shaul can be interchangeable to mean either or both the grave or hell, whereas Gehenna itself means hell. So these are three places that we can identify with as one of the final destinations is um, either uh, Shemaya or Gehenna. And so there are three heavens. Um, the first heaven is the firmament or the dome. So we have this atmosphere over the earth which is called the first heaven, that is the firmament. The second heaven would be the interstellar outer space or the environment of the cosmos. And, um, and then the third heaven would be the kingdom of God, the place where God dwells at. Ecclesiastes 12.7 then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. So we have the inversion of creation in death. Death is creation inverted. So when the corruptible becomes incorruptible, where death returns a man back to the dust that he came from, the spirit will return back to God. The body needs the spirit, as in man's creation, he needed the breath of God when God breathed life into him. He, when man was created, God breathed the Ruach into him. In James 2.26, for as the body without the spirit, for as the body without the spirit is dead. So without, without our spirit within us, we will be dead. So um, there's this concern of not really what happens to our body when we die, because it is corruptible, but we should be more concerned with what happens to the what happens to our spirit, because our spirit um, is eternal. Man-made ideas of man dying and immediately going to heaven or hell are just that, man-made ideas. We, we tend to get this idea, not just through church or Christianity, but through movies and through modern culture, that when a man dies, he immediately goes to heaven and hell, and this just isn't true. Man-made ideas suggesting that loved ones are looking down on us from heaven is um, preposterous and not really founded in scripture. There's no scripture or any kind of doctrine in the Bible that suggests that when we die that we're going to look down on our loved ones. So we have these two ideas of we immediately go to heaven or hell and that we're looking down on our loved ones that are all man-made and far-fetched. Man exists in an unconscious state of sleep when he dies. So we, we, um, we have this idea that when we die that we automatically just go to heaven and hell but with that idea, we're skipping the idea of the resurrection, and we're skipping the idea of judgment. Uh, death awaits the resurrection and the judgment. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 23. But every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward they that are Christ's at his coming. Um, so there will be this time when man will go through the resurrection, and then he'll be 
judged. Acts 2.34 says, For David is not ascended into the heavens. So David is still sleeping himself. He's not in the heavens. David isn't in heaven and neither is anyone else. But there first must be the resurrection. Perhaps the soul goes to paradise to sleep and await. Consider the thief on the cross when Yeshua said, Today you will be with me in paradise. So perhaps when someone dies, they go to sleep and they go to sleep in paradise and then wait, await the resurrection and then they go to the judgment. Um, so during the death process, the corruptible will put on incorruptible as seen in 1 Corinthians 15, 41. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So in, in the Hebrew, the idea of afterlife is called olam haba, where the righteous enjoy everlasting life and the wicked will be subjected to after everlasting torment. So in death, um, in death, our, all of our bodies will be are corruptible and they will uh, die. But when we die, we either become part of everlasting um, corruption or we become part of everlasting death, I mean life. So those who are part of the righteous enjoy everlasting life and the wicked and the unrighteous enjoy death. Because when we look at, in Genesis, during the story of creation, God says that if man was to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that he would die. That is a spiritual death. But when Jesus speaks of himself about us salvation, he says that there will be eternal life for those who have salvation. So that, that would signify to us that those who are righteous and have been born again and have the gift of salvation, there's an eternal life. And then those who are wicked and are unrighteous and rejected the gift of salvation, they have death. That's the spiritual death. Daniel 12.2 says, And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to an everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So this is another verse that's saying that we will that when we really die, we're not really going to a destination yet, but we are sleeping, awaking, awaking the resurrection and awaking, awaiting the judgment. Paradise is, appears to be a place where those who are, who are the righteous are sleeping at. Um, talking to the thief on the cross, Yeshua said unto them that he would be with him today in paradise. Man's journey to eternal life travels through the feasts that are, that are yet to be manifested. So when we look at the feasts of God, we see um, that there are some things that still have to be fulfilled in the remaining feasts, which are the Feast of Trumpets, otherwise known as Yom Teruah, and that represents the resurrection of the body and the coronation of the king. And then we have Yom Kippur, which is the Day of Atonement. That is the second coming of Christ and judgment. And then lastly, we have the Feast of Tabernacles, otherwise known as Sukkot. That happens to be the wedding of the bride and the groom. So um, in looking at heaven and hell, first looking at hell, we see that Shaul is also known as the hell grave, the death, the destruction, or the pit. So, um, hell is a place of a future judgment reserved for those who have rejected salvation, been paid for the wages of sin. Hell is this place of outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. It is a physical dimension of anguish. It is also called the second death. So this is also known as the spiritual death. It is an unquenchable fire, a place of torment, everlasting suffering and destruction. 
the everlasting life uh, in eternal life is that dimension of existence that is awaiting believers after the journey of the first death. So we shall all die, but after, um, if you go to hell, that is the second death, and if you go, go on to eternal life, that will be, <clears throat> that will be heaven. Eternal life is for the righteous who have ran the good life. The death of our physical bodies is referred to as sleeping, and death is seen as a state of existence where man's soul is separated from his physical body and thus becomes unconscious. After the big sleep or the physical death, there is this mass resurrection at the Feast of Trumpets. 1 Corinthians 15:51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. So that would indicate that death is really, in a, really a state of sleeping and consciousness. So in 1 Corinthians 15, 51, it says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Not all of us are going to sleep, because some of us will be remain during the great resurrection or what is called as the rapture. Um, but whether we are asleep or we're not asleep, we will all be changed. 1 Thessalonians 4:13 4, 4, through 14 says, But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that you sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. So there's this promise that after we sleep that there will be the resurrection of us. The decision made in this reality, the physical dimension, determines the rest of the next reality, the spiritual dimension. Heaven is the eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life is promised for those who are the righteous. The second death, the spiritual death, is promised for those who have not trusted in Yeshua as their Messiah. So heaven is the end of the journey for the restored garden. The goal in the afterlife is to overcome. We can still die and overcome. It, de it depends on if we finish well in this life. When we finish well at the end of our life, we have overcome. Death can defeat us and we can still overcome. We what we want in here is well done, good and faithful servant. James 1, 2 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. What is your status with God when it comes to the status, when it comes to the subject of the afterlife? Life or death is our choice. God doesn't sentence a person to death. They choose death. Rebellion against God will result in a person's decision for death. Surrendering to God will resort, result in a person's decision for life. It's all about who you know. Do you know the Messiah? Do you know the Master? In Matthew 7, 21, 23, it says that not everyone who says to me, Master, Master, shall enter into the reign of the heavens, but he who is doing the desire of my Father in the heavens. And, and then I shall declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. So God doesn't know the people who practice lawlessness. So if you want to know the relationship with God, you know what his um, what his um, his law is, what his commandments are. You don't want to be a practicer of lawlessness. We get to know who God is by walking in His ways. We get to the subject of baptism. Baptism, we understand in Hebrew roots, is under the name of, of Yahshua, Yeshua, Jesus. Uh, and we get baptized in living water only. Um, and a lot of baptisms you see in churches, baptism is done in like a, 
a baptismal, um, like a small swimming pool that's installed in the church. Well, this, this baptismal is stagnant water. It is not living water. Uh, so in Hebrew roots, we believe that baptism should be done in living water only. And so baptism is seen as uh, one of repentance. Um, pools and baptismals are stagnant and void of life. Living water would be like lakes, rivers, and oceans. Yeshua himself was baptized in a river, and so we figure if that's the way he did it, we should do that as well too. Uh, John baptized his followers in a living water. And we look in the Old Testament of baptisms. Uh, baptisms were always done in places of living water. Uh, when we get baptized, we are baptized unto the death of Yeshua, where we have the release of sins, we have the confession of sins. Uh, baptism involves a belief or a trust in God. Um, there is a baptism that we can do, um, not just at the initial salvation, but we can have baptisms at t times of teshuva. So teshuva happens around the time of of Yom Kippur and um, and um, Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. So during the days of awe, we can have times of baptisms, which will uh, we can have we can have every year, which will signify a time that we are washing away our sins. Uh, we are washing away through confession of sins that they become a a time that we are dedicating ourselves for another year to um, to remove the um, the leaven, the sin that's been in our lives. It's a time of rededicating our slive, lives back to God. In fact, a lot of people who come uh, into uh, Hebrew roots want to rededicate their lives into this new life of being Torah observant. So they will so they will become baptized um, in a in living water, so that um, they can rededicate their new life, their new journey. So they decided that they want to um, be, be rededicated in um, this new walk of Hebrew roots by being baptized. So baptism actually comes from an old um, system of ritual cl of cleansing um, where the priests uh, cleanse themselves before um, going into the temple. Uh, there was this ritual cleaning, cleansing for women, ritual cleansing for men. Uh, so this um, cleansing uh, through a baptism of washing away um, uncleanliness comes from a word called a, a mikvah, which is a ritual cleaning, a mikvah. Um, so let's look at these scriptures. In Acts 2.38, it says, then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In Rome, Romans 6, 3, it says, Know ye not that so many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. In Acts 19, 5, it says, When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. The idea in... Um, in Hebrew roots is that we are baptized unto the akkad, the oneness of God. In baptism we have the Hebraic tradition of purification by immersion in a ritual bath which is called a mikvah. Baptism can also speak of a separation unto God. So some, a lot of us who have come into uh, Hebrew roots or become um, Torah observant, we want to um, um, separate ourselves unto Yahweh um, coming into being Torah observant by being separated unto God by going through a mikvah or a baptism. So baptism is about death and resurrection. Having a unison with God and having this public confession of faith, a trust in God by being baptized. So when we understand that baptized means immersion, we, have, we get rid of all the sprinkling and Catholicism and uh, 
So we have, have to be immersed. Baptized means being immersed, where the sins and our old man are washed away. And, um, and so a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, baptisms in Hebrew roots will find ourselves being baptized. Um, you could be baptized in, a, in an ocean, you could be baptized in a river, baptized in a lake, be kind of hard in a stream, <laughs> not very deep. But we don't get baptized in pools. <clears throat> so we look at the commandments. We know that the Hebrew word for commandment is mitzvah. That means commandment. So the plural version of mitzvah would be mitzvot. So uh, when you ever see an ot, ot, or an im, im on a Hebrew word, we know that is a plural version of that word. So in the commandments, the mitzvot, we understand that these are the instructions which are, in fa which are found in the entire Bible. God's instructions is his word. Um, so his commandments are found in his instructions, and instructions are found in his word. The New, New Testament is based upon the Old Testament. Um, so there, um, there's, the New gets its inspiration from the Old. The New, the new is the Old revealed. I mean, the, the Old Testament, the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And we have more than just 10 commandments. We actually have 613 commandments. Not all of commandments apply to everyone. Okay? So we have commandments that apply to women. And we have, I mean, we have commandments that apply just to women. And some commandments that apply just to men. Some apply it to the priests. Some apply to the native-born Israelite. Some are ceremonial. Um, so you can see that not everyone keeps all of the commandments. It just depends on who you are and where you're at. We are encouraged by Yeshua to keep the commandments. Be careful not to teach others that they don't have to keep the commandments of God because uh, we have this um, scripture in Matthew 5.19 that addresses this. It says, Whosoever shall break one of the least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of God. But who shall ever do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of God. So while we want to teach others to do the commandments of God, we have to also be careful that we're not offending God by teaching others that they don't have to do these commandments. So when we teach people they don't have to keep the Sabbath day, then we are included in this that we will be the least in the kingdom of God. We want to be careful that we don't include ourselves in being the least in the kingdom of God. We want to make sure that we're teaching people to keep the commandments and that we are not one of these people that are teaching people not to keep the commandments such as the Sabbath day which people will go around teaching that we are not supposed to do. Leviticus 22.31 says, Therefore you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord. I mean, that's pretty plain and simple. In the commandments, we are supposed to keep them. John 14.15, the New Testament version of the Leviticus one says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Pretty plain and simple. If you love God, if you love Yeshua, if you love, uh, if you love God's word, uh, keep his commandments. The instruction in the Bible are God's instructions. Jesus' commands and God's commands are the one and the same because Jesus is God. The man, Adam, was fooled into thinking God didn't really say to keep his commandment. Not keep me, keeping the commandment of God is how we got in the trap of sin to begin with. We sin by not keeping God's commandments. By not keeping His commandments, we walk against God doing our own ways. In Proverbs 14, 12, it says, There is a way that seems right unto a man, but at the end thereof are the ways of death. So if we want to avoid death and we want to have life, we want to 
not do our own way. We want to do God's way. And God's ways are about his instructions. We don't have to wonder what are God's ways. He writes them out for us to know. So in um, we, we seem to have this misconceived idea in the church that there is this new law. So a covenant um, is barit, meaning a binding legal agreement. A covenant is made between two parties and is based upon some sort of agreement. The Mosaic law was based upon laws, the instructions given by God. The Old Covenant is based upon Adamic and Mosaic covenants. The Torah, which, include, which would involve the law or the commandments or the instructions, the Old Covenant points us to why we need a Messiah. So the Old Covenant being the Mosaic law points us out our sin and shows us that um, we need a Messiah, we need a Savior. If there were no laws to break, would we sin and thus need, thus need a Messiah? The law shows us that we are in desperate need of a deliverer from sin. We break the law every day, and before the law, there, before the law, there was no sin. The law points out to us what our offenses are. Romans 7, 7 through 8 says, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except that the law said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin taken occasion by the commandment wrought in me all manner of compensations. For without the law, sin was dead. So without, without the law, there is no sin. Romans 3.20 says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall be no flesh, there, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So we have um, the purpose of the law is to point out our sin so that we can repent. The new law cannot replace the old covenant because the old ministry of Yeshua wasn't to replace the old with the new or even the elimination of the law. Matthew 5, 17 through 19. Think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not coming to destroy, but to fulfill. So, uh, we've already discussed that the antithesis of destroy is to fulfill. So, if Yeshua is saying that he didn't, um, didn't come to destroy the law, well, the law is part of the old covenant, the old covenant, covenant, the old law, or what is called as the law, has not been done away with. So the opposite of of not of, uh, of destroying would be to fulfill, and that's what Yeshua came to do. He came to fulfill. Jeremiah 13 31 says, Behold the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah, is both a new and a separate covenant, yet at the same time, made up of the Abrahamic and Mosaic covenants. Um, it also has a little, some elements of the Adamic covenant as well, because the Adamic covenant said, if you will not eat of the, of the, of the tree of, the, the, the tree of the, um, knowledge of good and evil, he will live. But that, that was the Adamic covenant. But Adam broke that covenant, and so he incurred upon him the wages of sin and death, which were presented unto the rest of us. And so then we go into the um, Abrahamic covenant, which we have the promise of the land and about the seed. Um, and then we go into the Mosaic covenant about the, about the law and about the marriage covenant. Um, so we have elements of all the covenants that have been made with Adam. Uh, we also ha actually have the Noah, Noahide covenant, which is, uh, talks about that he won't, he won't flood the earth. 
Um, we have the Mosaic Covenant, the Abraham Covenant. They're all working together. Um, all the covenants are still in place. <laughs>